Okay, so I think uh, the next one we are going to have James. Uh, I think his screen is showing up. Hello, Hello James. Can you hear me okay? I can see, I can see, yeah, I hear you okay. And I can see um, you are under a very sunny environment. So maybe your face will be um, a little bit. Uh, I might be okay if I step backwards a little bit. Uh, I think maybe forward is better. Oh, cool, cool. Yes, yes. Turn, turn okay. uh, a bit. Okay. Yeah, yes. Oh, oh, this is great. Yes, yes, yes. Great, 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 great. We can see your face. Perfect. So <laughs> we have um, our part, second part company presenting. Uh, on the screen is James from uh, Percutus, the ready travel company. He will present you as showing on the screen empowering travelers in a post-COVID world, open innovation through open banking API co-creation. So I will pass the floor to James now. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, hi, everyone. It, it's great to have a chance to talk to you today from obviously very sunny Hong Kong. Uh, as Kathy just said, I'm James Butler, the CTO of Packeter Technologies. And today I'm going to talk to you about some of the work we've been doing on co-creating APIs and technology infrastructure in general to create financial services in collaboration with financial institutions and also with industry partners in travel, in hospitality, and in retail. And how API co-creation effectively serves as a new model for business collaboration and innovation. But now, as we are a uh, travel-related fintech, it's kind of difficult to talk about all of this without addressing the elephant in the room, the massive industry-wide and permanent changes that have been brought into effect by the global coronavirus pandemic. And what does all of this mean for banks and fintechs and ultimately for the, for the consumer? So before I dive into some more technical content, let me first begin by introducing Pecatus. So we provide fintech solutions and customer insights to co-create services for travelers with financial institutions with a focus on serving a younger customer base and frequent travelers. And we do this by using machine learning, data analytics, and smart devices. Really what this means is that we provide three core areas of expertise. Firstly, in building and deploying payment technologies, including unmanned kiosks, mobile payments, and so on. Secondly, we integrate directly with airlines and partners in the travel and hospitality industry to provide access to physical foreign currency and digital money and multi-currency point-of-sale type solutions. And finally, we build solutions grounded in data science, in artificial intelligence and in machine learning to develop insight from our transactional data and from wider travel data. This includes fraud detection and consumer protection, uh, demand forecasting, and also some AI-powered KYC solutions that we've developed in-house and a whole lot more, some of which I'll be touching on in a little bit more detail in the next few minutes. So looking back at the COVID situation, Brian Chesky, a few months ago, the, the CEO of Airbnb, was recently quoted as saying that travel as we know it is over, and it is never coming back. Now, that doesn't sound very good for those of us in the travel industry, not for Airbnb. But of course, what he really meant this statement, I think, is that the pandemic has and will continue to serve as a catalyst for permanent change, for permanent changes in consumer behavior within tourism and travel. And really, even in a whole lifetime, it is rare to see such a sudden earth-shattering impact on such a large and well-established industry. We've never seen anything like this before. And now, eight months or so into the pandemic, there is a whole lot of dust to settle. And it's difficult to pin down with any certainty in timescales what's going to happen next. With that being said, we do have some early insights um, to share those with you. So let's take a look at what the post-COVID landscape might actually look like. I suppose the first thing to say is that post-COVID may well prove to be somewhat of an elusive concept. And I think we're really looking at what a lot of people have recently been calling a new normal. There's a whole lot of unknowns relating to the development of an effective vaccine, how long it will take to manufacture and distribute, and what sorts of protection it will even provide against the different strains. It seems more likely to me that we'll shift from a pandemic situation to a messy system of ongoing partial border restrictions, of endemic coronavirus regions, annual vaccines with potentially patchy availability. And in general, I think we're a very long way from a stable situation. But that being said, we are beginning to see signs of something that might be described as metastable, with travel corridors opening up between specific nations and specific regions. And I think we can look to the UK as an early indication of consumer behavior within this new normal. 
where despite the fact we're seeing a continuation in the increase in the number of cases, actually mortality and serious illness appears to be somewhat leveling off or even coming down. And in the UK, after a few months of essentially zero outbound travel and tourism and everyone's holidays were cancelled, what we see now is increases to travel in areas that escaped or have reduced lockdown and quarantine quite so Portugal, Spain and Greece. Uh, back in March, there was a, a questionnaire, the sources there, and we found that a, a majority of Brits could not be persuaded to book a holiday under any circumstances while the coronavirus outbreak was active. A few months later, uh, when it becomes kind of clear to everyone that this isn't going anywhere, a clear majority said they were in fact re willing to rebook a holiday despite the outbreak being ongoing and all they're really waiting for is the government lockdown restrictions to be eased to enable them to do it. And I think this is a clear demonstration of consumer adaptation to this new situation given that there, there is no end in sight. So we, we do expect there to be a shift in what are popular tourist destinations with people more willing to go off the beaten path and perhaps explore lesser known cities. This is in part driven by a desire to spend less time in dense crowds and on busy public transport networks, but also it's going to be driven by an increase in price sensitivity. And what I mean by that is travel is undoubtedly going to become more expensive in the mid to long term, both due to the ripples felt from the initial demand shock that shook the industry when the pandemic first began, and also due to the increased physical challenges that have been brought on by the continued reduction in demand and the social distancing and the sanitation requirements and everything else that goes with that. So I include a diagram here from the International Air Transport Association. Um, it's taking a look at the competing downloads and corporate pressures on flight costs right now. And in fact, what they're actually expecting is a short-term reduction in flight costs as airlines slash rates to maintain some level of occupancy and revenue, and that's in fact what we've seen. And then followed by a longer-term demand stabilization with rates uh, stabilizing also at a higher price point than they were ordered. So, so really what we're talking about here is we're seeing an acceleration of trends that in large part were already well underway. And what I mean by this is that there is a growing disconnect between what incumbent operators are offering now and the expectations of young people looking to go traveling. The trips are going to become shorter and more private and more flexible. But of course, flying airport visits and all the other transport necessary are you know, inescapably part of traveling and aren't going anywhere. But the risks can be mitigated by reducing human interaction through online bookings, cashless payments, and contactless checking processes, and contactless hotel keys, and so on, all help reducing unnecessary exposure. And actually, this is a well-established trend in the 18 to 35 millennial demographic anyway. Uh, we've seen since the COVID uh, pandemic that 50% of tourist destinations that are open are mandating online ticket purchase. So if you don't book online, you can't go. And many have stopped accepting cash altogether for hygiene concerns. Visa found in a recent study that 66% of consumers would choose a store that offers contactless payment over an identical store that doesn't offer it. But all of this must be contrasted with the trend to go off the beaten track where payment technologies might be a little bit more outmoded and cash may well still be king. I think the key thing to take away from all of this is flexibility. Flexibility in booking, flexibility in payment methods, and flexibility in financing. And as we've said, there's going to be a higher cost associated with travel. And I think anyone that can help in mitigating this to some extent is going to see some success over the next two to five years and beyond. Through, for example, vertical integration with banks or credit providers, providing more flexible financing payment options for potentially very expensive vacations. Okay, so now I've set the stage a little bit and considered what travel and tourism is actually going to look like post-2020. I want to introduce you to a case study in co-creation and what it looks like to innovate technology solutions using open API technologies between a startup, an airline, and also financial institutions. By taking a look at one of our proofs of concept running right now at the headquarters of Cathay Pacific at the Hong Kong International Airport. And that's our smart effects network called Ready Travel, which forms a key part of our go-to-market go strategy at Pecatus. So co-creation is a, a recurring theme through this presentation and through the whole conference, actually. So let me just clarify what I mean when I talk about co-creation. When developing a new service, whether it's tech or, or finance or, or whatever, the crucial thing is to start with the customer and their needs and then work backwards to the implementation. None of the great revolutions in tech today have ever been achieved by starting with, okay, 
So we've got this technology, what can we do with it and how can we monetize it? Co-creation then allows us to do exactly that by letting our partner define the scope of the challenge. And then through an iterative cycle of improvement with live users on the ground testing with real people, we can optimize our technologies to provide the best possible user experience and user journey long before the sort of outlay of resources of capital and so on that would be necessary for a full public launch. So, so what, what is ready travel then? Simply put, ready travel enables cabin and cockpit proof to buy and withdraw physical foreign currency either using cash, whether that's Hong Kong dollars, US dollars, or one of more than 30 different currencies, and also directly using the Hong Kong dollar bank account. They can exchange currency 24 seven using the mobile app and pick it up on their way to the flight from the kiosks that we've located in the Cathay Pacific dispatch area. There's no need for them to interact with a human at any point in the transaction, and the whole thing can be completed with one finger press on the kiosk. Everything else is handled directly on their mobile device. And you can see in the pictures I'm sharing now um, what this looks like in the real world. We have the physical kiosks that can accept and dispense cash, and also an accompanying mobile application which handles pretty much all of the user actions. So, so next, I, I want to take a look at where APIs and open APIs actually come into all of this, from both a technical and from a strategic standpoint. I, I'm sure many of you are, or most of you are already aware of HKMA's uh, ongoing four-phase strategy for open API development. First phase being focused on very simple query relating to product information and mostly already public domain data, which was released early last year. And I think there are four or 500 APIs available now, or more than that, some of which we're consuming packages, which I'll talk about in a minute. Looking a little bit to the future, the third and fourth phase here are associated with querying existing customer data, such as balance transactional information. And finally, the capacity to initiate payments and transfers via third parties using open APIs. Phase four is where a lot of promise lies for startups, I think. And although we're some way away from this being truly really open, we have definitely seen an openness to collaborate and exposure of these types of endpoints with individual partnerships on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think that's okay. I think it's a necessary precursor to a truly open AI. An open API is bound to be semi-closed collaborative development and testing processes. And uh, you'll notice that I've caveated the title here that we're leveraging sometimes open APIs. So now let's see how all of this looks from an architectural perspective with the Ready Travel platform and explore our personal adoption journey at Pectus. So this is a vastly oversimplified infrastructure diagram that I've put together just to give you an idea of how all of these different components, the partner financial institutions, apps, kiosks, all work together to produce the overall user experience I talked about a couple of minutes ago. The implementation details for the Ready Travel backend here don't really matter, and what I want to focus on is the externalities, how and why we're interfacing uh, third parties to this infrastructure. What this diagram basically shows is how a user can interface with a mobile application and a physical kiosk, which through a sequence of APIs allow them to physically withdraw Japanese yen or euros or Australian dollars or multiple other currencies 24 hours a day, or from the Hong Kong dollar denominated bank account or with cash, uh, an exchange rate that is comparable to interbank FX rates. In terms of our adoption of open APIs, let me first draw your attention to point A on the diagram. And what we have here is a whole bunch of loosely coupled microservices that interface directly with banks, in some cases using the Checo API X platform, and in others by consuming publicly exposed APIs made available directly by the banks. And also in some cases, scraping services that apply optical character recognition and other technologies to digitize information that is not yet made available to us through an API. For example, pricing data from money changes um, and other players that haven't yet to adopt an open API framework. And being able to source real-time pricing data like this, both from banks, we have a direct relationship, and also with third parties has been really invaluable to us in terms of our ability to ensure the prices that we can quote at scale are competitive to the alternatives of the airport or at tourist destinations. So, so now moving over to the left, looking at point B, I want to show you the interface we have with a financial institution via both a backend to backend API and also with an accompanying client SDK. <laughs> Now, if you're unfamiliar with the concept, a client SDK is basically just a front-end wrapper to an API that lets you expose all of the functionality of it without exposing the implementation details surrounding the HTTP messaging and the authentication and so on. 
So it makes it a little bit easier and a little bit more secure. So having created this experience in collaboration with a financial institution, what this allows us to do effectively is to onboard users to open an account for storing currency with the bank from within our own application. And by building around technological infrastructure for processing cash, for receiving payment instructions, for pricing FX, and for operating the network and kiosks, and by taking ownership of the whole front-end experience, we're effectively able to harmonize the needs of the consumers within a retail space or airport and the technological or infrastructural capacity of the regulated financial institutions to design the best possible user experience for, in this case, frequent travelers. But as I alluded to on the last slide, I think this is really generalizable. And it's looking like a huge growth area once these sorts of APIs and SDKs move from a private trial basis with specific partners to a more generally open model of banking as a service. And if we take all of these innovations together, we can start to do some really powerful things to optimize the flow, to bring the cost down, and to help somewhat ameliorate the increasingly daunting cost of travel in our post-COVID world to the end consumer. So the real power from in open APIs, from my perspective, comes from our newfound ability to combine disparate data sources and services in novel ways, especially when we go beyond banking and look at many more data sources and services. In some sense, I see the role of Pecatus in all of this to be providing a kind of an architectural glue, if you like, to combine API endpoints across banking, and retail, and government to form a cohesive infrastructure for seamlessly integrating financial services and retail at the point of experience from the perspective of customers. And this also forms a key part of our data science strategy. To give a more concrete example, by, by combining our own transaction data with external data such as flight APIs from airport authorities, and also those provided by, for example, Skyscanner and related travel organization companies, we can actually correlate our foreign exchange order flow to travel patterns. And by understanding the expected change in flight frequency over time and low factor utilizations, and even the rate of change of the number of COVID cases internationally, we can dynamically infer what our demand characteristics will look like in the next week, the next month, and even beyond that. And all of this can support a kind of a peer-to-peer -peer swapping of currencies between users without us having to onboard additional FX risk. And that means that we're not tying up capital and inventory that we don't expect to move, for example, uh, due to border closures. And we can go one step further than that even. By evaluating the spreads being charged internationally, and uh, looking at the buy and the sell price at different banks in different locations and how they change relative to each other over time. I'm looking at options prices on exchanges um, and the cost of various hedging products from banks through their open APIs. We can make valid inferences about the expected risk or the volatility that we're going to see looking ahead at these different currencies. And we can accommodate for that ahead of time. So by lowering the cost of acquisition of our inventory of our, the different currencies that we offer, we're able to offer super competitive pricing that incumbents might actually find it quite difficult to, to profitably match. So coming back to building partner ecosystems, I've mentioned this or alluded to this a couple of times. And specifically today, I focused on payments and FX optimization. And also talked a little bit about our quantitative research in data analytics and forecasting. But there's a lot more scope here for open innovation and for interfacing between different financial technologies in different ways. And really, in, in the hopefully the near future, I believe we're going to see some really great innovations at the nexus or the intersections of these pillars leading to the creation of wonderful user experiences that I think we're only just starting now as an industry to realize are even possible. So I'll, I'll finish off now just by zooming out a little bit and recapping the, the, the why. Why should startups care about the open banking initiative? What, what's in it for them? So I hope I've been able to demonstrate at least a little bit today that open banking participation provides a great platform for open innovation, APIs spanning product information, customer acquisition, account information, and transactions enable startups to participate in building partner ecosystems alongside financial institutions and well-established players in retail and hospitality and travel. And of course, with startups comes an agility and an innovation that is difficult to achieve as a large financial institution alone. The ongoing global fintech revolution that we're seeing today, especially in Europe and the, the US, is a result of the interplay between innovative startups uh, that can take risks and don't have any 
burdens of legacy infrastructure and also the stable incumbents that people trust and are certainly not going anywhere. And I think this really serves as a great collaborative model for open innovation. So finally, one of the most valuable aspects of open banking that I touched on today, at least in the longer term, is the idea of banking as a service. And this for me means getting access to the payment rails, as it were, of banking and of payment systems, as this is one of the most difficult aspects for young, possibly undercapitalized startups to, to get on board with. And it can prevent a real barrier to, to innovation. And working with financial institutions to co-design APIs and the accompanying SDKs can enable a greater access to payments rails that until, until this year would have really been just impossible. So um, that's uh, all I have for me. Uh, I just want to thank the rest of my team. Uh, so we've got Victor, the CEO, with a, a banking background, and Ed and Cynthia from consulting and manufacturing, and then myself providing the technology leadership with Eric, who handles all the system development and IT development, and our quant and physicist in residence, Dr. Krishnan. So thanks very much for your time. If you've got any questions now, I'll be happy to answer them. Or if you're feeling shy, then you can feel free to email me at this address here, and I will be happy to talk to you further. Thank you, James. I think uh, if uh, you guys have questions, then you can email drops and a message to James uh, as you have seen on the screen. And then James, I have a question for you, given we have uh, two, three minutes left. Uh, I, I wanna ask that um, you mentioned about the partner ecosystem is very interesting um, concept. And you also talked about that uh, your company or the platform is like a glue to put uh, things together, right? So. Mm -hmm. um, for your future development, um, is there any types of uh, partner ecosystem in your mind you guys are trying to build? As I also see you are working with airline company, financial company, uh, something like that. Mm, so, so we're working with Cathay Pacific at the moment to, yeah. to trial our FX uh, solution for the cabin crew. So they spend a lot of money on hotels when they're, when they're flying around and they need access to cash. And so we've been really using this as a platform for evaluating our own technologies before ultimately using this as part of our go-to-market strategy to, to expand um, not only to other airlines, but also to, for example, airport lounges. And in, in terms of building ecosystems, what I mean by that is we can, we can go beyond just um, airlines and integrate retail experiences. Um, people buying things before they go traveling, the luggage, for example, and SIM cards, and also booking trips with tour guides, and really sort of integrating all of these things into, into one platform with, with banking and payments at the center to really sort of make life a little bit easier and reduce the amount of unnecessary contact and hassle that, that our customers have to deal with. I see. I really appreciate your presentation today. And then um, thank you for you again. Uh, I, I hope uh, um, there will be uh, 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 comments or thoughts, uh, any thoughts, any questions uh, we welcome to take. So thank you, James. Okay, thanks very much, Kathy. Thanks.